Welcome to The Road. This is a weekly podcast of All Saints Lutheran Church. I'm your host, John Pedersen, and I serve as pastor. Each week, we reflect on faith, life, and navigating the road ahead. The language of journey is common when we think about life. It has its joys and challenges along the way, and we all need a little encouragement and guidance at times to keep us going. There's a word in the Bible, asphalia, which means truth, but it's the same root word we use in English for asphalt, if you can believe that is a solid surface that makes travel easier and more assured. And so every week we're going to be exploring elements of faith and life that keep us on the road. Faith isn't about living a perfect life. It's about finding our way, getting through rough spots, but seeking out those great vistas too. You can find my weekly message here, but you'll also find special conversations with guests who have insights on things like wellness, parenting, and living with unique purpose. If you appreciate this podcast, remember to subscribe where possible and share it with a friend. Here's this week's message. Well, we're closing out our series, Change Your World, today. Most of us have some vision of a better world, uh, whether it's a sweeping shift in society or some kind of improvement in our own situation. You can either end up feeling resigned to the way things are, or you can try to make a difference. There are a lot of change strategies. You can choose to work on deficiencies or build on strengths. Many studies suggest you get better results when you utilize your strengths rather than trying to improve on what you're not good at already. Of course, both seem important. So one tactic is to use your strengths creatively to address your weaknesses. You know, if you're good with people, but you're bad at organizing and planning, Use your people skills to collaborate and help come up with a plan. So that's one way of thinking about how to change the world. But um, another common back and forth relates to whether you direct change efforts outward or inward. A lot of public policy, for example, focuses on outward changes that we can make to improve things. Those are more identifiable and measurable. You can find examples across the spectrum of attempts to change the world with different laws. And the primary function and responsibility of government, for example, is to do just that, to help govern the outward actions and activities of our society, making sure people and groups aren't acting unjustly and unfairly, but also positively offering services and promoting things that provide for the common good. This is important work uh, that impacts all of us. Many religious and moral restrictions uh, are also intended to change outward behavior with the intention of making people or society better somehow. I still talk to some older members on occasion who grew up in churches or communities where it was considered wrong to play cards or to dance. Uh, Some of you might remember that. And as long as you adhered to certain external behaviors, by either refraining from the wrong things or doing and saying the right things, you could be considered a good person. This kind of approach remains a focus of some religious and philosophically minded groups. Every time um, we drive my son to college, we go through Amish communities and it's very clear that rejection of modern life is a central part of the faithfulness of those groups. But today's scripture from Mark and James points us to another important factor in someone's overall well-being and the moral purity of a person. What the Pharisees and teachers of the religious law at the time of Jesus believed was that living a holy life was intricately connected to outward habits and rituals. Keeping physically clean on the outside was connected to being spiritually clean on the inside. Washing hands the right way and keeping other physical items clean was also a reflection of your inner piety. And even as I read the description of some of those activities in Mark, I have to say it's all pretty good practice, you know? Mark indicated they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash. Probably a pretty good idea. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups and pots and bronze kettles and beds. All sounds like a good idea to me. Those are things that most of us embrace today. But often these rituals, again, were very closely linked, not only with hygiene, but also indicated your moral 
and religious standing. And not all of the outward behaviors that were typical of religious practice at the time had the same kind of common sense associated with them. Some seemed more arbitrary to our modern eye. And ultimately, Jesus says in verse 15, it's not what goes into your body that defiles you. You are defiled by what comes from your heart. For from within, out of a person's heart, come evil thoughts. And Jesus proceeds to list what is essentially all of the commandments. The point being, the true measure of someone's wholesomeness or purity isn't about outward practices, but it's about what's in their heart. Because it's easy to do all the required things over here, but still hate your neighbor and treat them unfairly. And so what Jesus says and what he said throughout his ministry was that the problem runs a lot deeper. We need to work on our heart. The problem is much larger than we we might want to admit. So if the problem is on the inside and can't be fully fixed by what we do on the outside, then what are we supposed to do? What Paul is suggesting is that we need to go to the source of the problem. Faith helps nurture a loving relationship with God in our neighbor, in our hearts. And if we don't address that, making external changes will forever be like some version of whack-a-mole or just a facade. When faith is truly operating in our lives, it's not that we do the right things because we're under threat of punishment or discipline. It's not because we think other people or God are looking over our shoulders. It's because it comes from our own heart. We want to do the right thing. Our minds and our hearts are transformed on the inside. And you can set up all the laws in the world that you want, and they need to be there in many cases, but people will always look for loopholes and find new paths around the laws and contest them if they can. And that appears to have been God's frustration with the law that was the foundation of the first covenant in the Old Testament, what we essentially think of uh, simply as the commandments. The laws were good and they were right, they still are, but in God's relationship with humanity, they didn't succeed as desired in changing the inner core of the heart. That doesn't mean that laws are wrong or not still useful in some ways, but if something isn't working, what do you do? What Jesus does is at first raise the standards of the law. He expands the meaning of the law to the spirit of the law to show that simply going through the motions isn't the point. God desires a deeper kind of transformation in people. Our reading from Mark today skipped over verses 9 to 13 because it gets long, but I think it's helpful to know what's there. Those verses are Jesus going into greater detail about how the religious leaders had found a loophole to get around the letter of the law. In this case, if someone set aside money for the temple, it allowed them under tradition to get out of their obligation to take care of their mother and father. So they found a legal and religious loophole to avoid honoring their father and mother. And Jesus chides them as hypocrites for this. In verse six, again, he says, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. The Pharisees have chosen one aspect of the ritual law, namely hand washing, to critique his disciples. But they've opened themselves up to a world of critiques on their own behaviors. And what God has always wanted is a true relationship with us, a relationship built on a true heart. God is willing to forgive our sins if he can enter into a relationship with us based on truth and love. What seems to irk Jesus more than anything else in this story today are people who put on the facade of holiness but are, who are just as fallible as everyone else on the inside. What the Pharisees needed and what we all need with each new day is a new heart. And that requires some self-examination. And this is what James is talking about in our first reading today when he says, for if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves and on going away immediately forget what they were like. 
So this is a passage that Soren Kierkegaard picked up on in writing his book for self-examination. Kierkegaard was a Danish philosopher and Lutheran theologian who is considered by many to be the founder of existentialism, which has been quite a dominant philosophical movement in our modern world. Kierkegaard used this illustration of a mirror in talking about how to read scripture and reflect upon yourself. And he wrote, the first requirement is that you must not look at the mirror, observe the mirror, but must see yourself in the mirror. The second requirement is that in order to see yourself in the mirror, when you read God's word, you must remember to say to yourself incessantly, it is I to whom it is speaking. It is I to whom it is speaking. And finally, if you want to look at yourself in the mirror with true blessing, you must not promptly forget how you looked. You must not be the forgetful hearer or reader of whom the apostle says in our reading from James today, he looked at his bodily face in a mirror but promptly forgot how he looked. And so what would Kierkegaard suggest we do with today's gospel reading from Mark? Instead of us pointing fingers at the Pharisees and scribes who Jesus calls hypocrites, we should read the passage and see ourselves in it. Consider that we're the Pharisees and scribes we too find ways to justify ourselves with our beliefs, our behaviors, and words which we count as credits to us, and yet we fall short in other ways. Kierkegaard said about the parable of the Good Samaritan, when you read it, but by chance a priest came down that same road, and when he saw him, he passed by, then you shall say to yourself, it is I. I do think this is a helpful way to read the Bible. It's important, however, <laughs> to clarify that the Bible isn't always about us. <laughs> and not everything written in the Bible was intended to apply directly to each one of us when we read it. But it, it can be a very useful way to think about a passage. And in the same way, that we might see some of our imperfections in the mirror of scripture, we're also invited to see that we are recipients also of God's grace and love, like those Jesus reaches out to heal and to forgive and to encourage. When we look into the mirror of God's word and when we examine ourselves with an awareness of our failings as well as the grace that God extends to us, that grace and peace have the power to heal our hearts and to remake them with new perspective and compassion. That's the point at which faith shifts from the simple implementation of life hacks and new behaviors, as helpful as some of those may be, to tending to our hearts and souls and seeking to live out God's love in new organic ways in the situations and the inevitable dilemmas that we encounter. We no longer seek a defined formula to be a better person as an end in itself and use that to justify ourselves, but we bring our newfound love and grace to bear as God's spirit guides us and inspires us in all of life's duties, problems, successes and failures, experiences, and perplexities. Amen. That's this week's message. You don't have to navigate the road ahead alone. You can join with others at All Saints. Visit allsaintsmtka.org for more information. Have a great week.